isso aqui é... Boa tarde a todos, eu sou a Mônica Escaramuzo, eu sou editora de empresas do jornal Valor Econômico e vou apresentar hoje aqui o painel A Transformação Sustentável do Brasil. É, temos, aqui no, é, temos aqui nesse painel os representantes do governo brasileiro, ao meu lado Marina Silva, ministra da, do Meio Ambiente, Nízia Trindade, ministra da Saúde e Alexandre Silveira, ministro de Minas e Energia. Queria começar perguntando à ministra Marina, a senhora esteve aqui em 2023 para trazer uma mensagem ao Brasil, é, para, para o mundo, aqui em Davos, é, mostrar que o Brasil estava comprometido com a agenda ambiental. Queria que a senhora fizesse um balanço desse último ano e me contasse para a gente é, quais são os desafios para a transformação sustentável do país e da agenda internacional. <risos> Obrigada. É, bom estar aqui com você, Nízia, Alexandre, todos vocês. Acho que há um ano atrás, quando eu e o ministro Fernando Haddad estivemos aqui, não é, querida Marisol, está ali? A gente estava vivendo aquele momento do Brasil voltou. E isso era muito forte aonde quer que a gente fosse. Acho que agora a gente tem uma questão... This was strong wherever we were. And here now we have a... Uh... A different perspective. Brazil is packed and it is well set it and this is important we had an agenda and at first we said that the brazil brazilian um, agenda will be a cross-cutting one and we would strengthen the environmental system and we wanted to work with sustainable development and that agenda and more than say what we would not do were not allowed to do we wanted to show what we would doing transparently and i think that environmentally the environmental policy is now becoming a cross-cutting one and in this year of uh, ecological transformation coordinated by the finance minister haddad we have a low carbon policy we have updated the ppc dam we have decreased a 50 percent uh, uh, we had a 50% reduction of uh, logging in the Brazilian Savannah de Cerrado, and we are working with the, resuming the conservation areas and the indigenous lands. We still have major challenges ahead of us. Minister Ninzia and Minister Alexandre know about the challenges we have, but we can say that we're back, we're settled, and we can now say that we have had some gains and substantial ones too and structuring gains the major challenge is how we're going to make all of these comparative advantages that brazil have become increasingly distributive uh, advantages instead of competitive advantages if I can make this pun, low carbon economy should be a tonic in Brazil. We should be a major producer of staples, of clean energy, and make our contribution to the planet's energy transformation. So I believe that the effort of having an agenda that will prioritize sustainable finance, bioeconomics, the new infrastructure, and circular economy. On top of that, we are also working with technological density, and that is the result of the 21st century in line with the 1.5 mission of Dubai, recently agreed upon, and with the issue of facing the climate problem and also facing the problems of social in, uh, inequality, we want to have managerial capacity, investments, tax reform, and a stabilized democracy in spite 
of the four years of democratic instability we lived through in the past. Now I give the floor to Minister Alexandre Silveira. Brazil is a main player in the international market for developing or structuring a um, energy position because of the matrix and the size of the Brazilian population. What are the objectives of this ministry regarding energy transition and what are the tools that the government will put in place in order to reach this goal? Dear Monica, dear friends Nizia and Marina, I would like to stress that Brazil has already performed its energy transition for many decades Brazil was building its regulatory stability. We respect contracts. We have social and political stability. As a country, we have one of the best transmission uh, systems in the world. We have 186 a thousand kilometers of transmission. We are taking firm steps to strengthen our transmission system even further. In this first year of the Lula administration, we made contracts totaling 36 billion reais. We are going to make auctions for another 20 billion now in March so that we can double our solar and wind complex in uh, the northeast in, in Brazil, transmitting it to the Lodes Center, which is the southeast. Brazil last year in, uh, uh, increased its uh, uh, generation ability of 9 <clears throat> excuse me, gigawatt, 8.4, it's solar. So we are already the leader of the energy transition worldwide. We want it to be just and inclusive. Brazil, in the first term of the Lula administration, created the greatest, one of the greatest uh, um, energy programs in the world, which was light for all, Luz para todos. We are going to double to uh, more than 2 million connections uh, this year in Luis Para Todos. We are making progress in the decarbonization of the transportation and mobility sector. We have the Renova Bio in Brazil, which is an example of an incentive to producing low carbon fuels. We have expanded together with uh, Marina Silva at CNPE and the two CNPEs, the Energy Council of Brazil, uh, which is a meeting of 16 ministers and uh, President Lula um, headed it. We approved the expansion of biodiesel from 10 to 14 percent in the mix, and we know that the big barn for humankind is Brazil, besides being one of um, clean and renewable energies. Brazilians have paid for this new energy complex, and we are going to advance it even further by attracting investments so that we can not only have low carbon agriculture, but we can also manufacture our uh, goods like ores, producing these goods in Brazil itself, creating jobs and opportunities and fighting inequality, which is the major objective of our government, to have a, a brotherhood, an equal society. We are discussing world peace, and I think that peace is very much intertwined with prosperity, as President Lula said. Prosperity is creating opportunities. So energy transition, as Pope Francis said, has to be taken care of in industrialized countries in a very serious manner so that it is quick and fair, especially with developing countries, namely that it plays a role in helping us in protecting the planet, but it should also be a major opportunity for social inclusion. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Minister. The health sector is a very important one, and 
has a very, very major uh, role to play in Brazil, and it accounts for 9 million direct jobs. How can your ministry contribute to sustainable transition, and what are the policies that can help in this process over the next few years? Thank you very much, Monica. I am also very grateful for the invitation for being here. Marisol made a visit to us, uh, uh, to Latin America from the forum, and I felt the importance of this challenge. Before I talk about this, a brief word about the discussion about health in this meeting. Usually we see health in the aspects that pertain to making climate and environmental problems more severe, as well as social problems. But in our understanding, just like Minister Marina and Minister Alessandra have uh, explained, health has to take part in the effort of mitigation and adaptation. And by the way, we are working in, along those lines in the Interministerial Committee headed by uh, Minister Marina, but the, but health can play a major role in transition in uh, um, changing into a new model. So this is the first idea. This is how we can understand how this strategy of the role of health, the role it can play right now. Marina and Alexandre have mentioned reindustrialization as a policy. And it is being coordinated by Vice President Minister Alkman. It is stated in terms of uh, missions in order to guide this policy. And in the case of Hills, this mission is based on the single health system uh, in Brazil, SUS, the so called SUS, which is the largest around the world with more than two. 100 million people. I think that uh, ecological transition understood in terms of social and environmental sustainability, and by the way, as the other two ministers have uh, talked about the interdependency of these two terms, this also applies to health. So one of the pillars of the industrialization in health, and this idea is about integrating industrial policy with services or with the needs of the SUS health system. The integration should also be based on the idea that industry should have a very active role in the transformation based in biodiversity and biomass, how this can help developing the country, circular economy, as has already been mentioned here. So the health complex, which is now being formulated and established as a strategy, this is, for instance, led Brazil to manufacture bio uh, chemicals. It can now be a strong and active element in a sustainable transition. So the strategy that has only just been launched by the president last September that has brought together several ministries will be meant not just to mitigate the terrible effects of climate change that we have felt in Brazil, and even now, with floods in the southeast and in Rio de Janeiro, we know that they're going to be increasingly intense, but also in building a positive agenda towards a new model for social and economic development. Minister Marina, let's talk about COP30, which is going to be hosted officially by Brazil in the state of Pará. And there was a plenary session that you headed 
where you headed the Brazilian delegation in COP28. How do you plan to use COP30 in order to accelerate the sustainability process in Brazil and around the world? Well, Monica, COPs contribute not only to climate and environmental issues, but also to economic dynamics. And COP28 has laid out new parameters. Decisions were made regarding adaptation, mitigation, that have to be taken seriously because we are living through a climate emergency. And this accounts for major investments. We are being swamped by torrential rain in Brazil. We are also suffering very major long droughts. There are areas that are becoming a desert because of climate change. And this calls for investments in infrastructure that has to be adapted, reconstruction of certain areas. In some cases, we even have to move populations around, um, irrigation drainage. This calls for major investments. And now in mitigation, we have investments in renewable energy. We have to make strong investments so that we can reach our goal for reducing methane in farming. Furthermore, as of COP28, a bold decision has been made after 31 years, which was to include in the agenda the uh, transition to stop fossil, uh, using fossil energies. So renewable energy will have to be used three times more with robust investments responsibly. And we also have to understand that the major problem we are facing is CO2 emission because of the use of coal, oil, and gas. So how are we to hold this discussion around the world. The pendulum of investment will go towards this place, which is that of creating a new cycle of prosperity so that we can have food and energy security, provide dignified jobs to people, and to take climate justice into account, as Minister Alexandre said, the rich countries are to lead these processes. The developing countries will also participate, but based on the principle of a common accountability, which are also differentiated. So the COP of desertification, climate, or whatever it is, have a leveraging effect on to development. Science has played its role, as I always say. Society has been playing its role. And we have a deficit, which is that of governments and corporations in the financial system. And I see that it is very positive now that governments, the financial system, and corporations are trying to work towards reaching this goal of 1.5. I was in a panel. And scientists were saying, even if we do all of our homework, we're going to live through the impacts of the change that has already taken place for another three decades. If we do not do our homework, we're going to live through this impact for another four or five years. So there's no more time to lose. We have to bring together knowledge. Uh, and and uh, this has to be based on evidence. And when governments and corporations uh, push forward, this will make a difference. Thank you very much. Minister, we'd like to talk about G20. Brazil is currently presiding in the G20 and will host a meeting, and you will have a major role to play in terms of the discussions around energy transition. What are the specific objectives that Brazil has during its G20 presidency? And how can this opportunity also help us in integrating other objectives in Latin America for energy integration? G20 is a huge opportunity for the energy transition in Brazil to be seen by the entire world. 
seen, as I mentioned, as a transition that takes into account global economy, that takes into account aside from sustainability, which is essential, also looks at the economic aspect, fighting inequality. So we want an energy transition that is balanced because it needs to respect the sovereignty and inequality between countries that already exists, but it needs to be fair. It's about a new economy, a green economy. As I've mentioned, in Brazil we've already advanced very much in terms of this energy transition and we're going even further. And of course this has a cost. This morning I was speaking to Folha de São Paulo. This has a very important cost to the Brazilian population. I was with the president in Parichins to launch the biggest decarbonization program in the planet to decarbonize the Amazon region. We launched the program there that allowed us to launch a transmission line all the way from uh, Parichins. This allows us to stop burning uh, diesel to generate power. On the same day, we also relaunched the program I mentioned before, Luis Para Todos, Light for All, and we have launched construction to integrate Roraima, the last state that's still not connected to our grid. Can you imagine a country the size of Brazil, continental dimension, with 100% of it being connected to our grid, to our uh, system? This will allow us to work much better on the connection of our country, but also on the connection of all of the American, the South American continent. We're already connected to Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay. We have a very good example of cooperation and joint management with Paraguay, in the case of the Itaipu plant. And now we want to also have this kind of connection with Venezuela, so we're working on that to have hydropower, which is clean power, so that we can stop running the thermoelectric plants that are still going on in Roraima and allow uh, this area of Brazil to be decarbonized, this very important area, which is the Amazon. And as Minister Marina has said, Brazil is back to the discussions and it's back to discuss the real problems that we have. So we're no longer, no longer talking about ourselves, debating what is real and what isn't, we're really concerned with people's lives and livelihoods. And I think the G20 presidency will allow us to once again ask for all countries, all industrial all con industrialized countries to invest in a very specific way and with important contributions so that we have investments in energy transition, in low carbon economies, because this is still very far from being a reality in countries in Brazil, because of the fact that our energy mix is 88% clean and renewable energy, and we're still investing so that it is cleaner, because we have the biofuels which are for us, as oil is for Saudi Arabia, one third of fuels that are used in our transportation mix come from ethanol and biodiesel in Brazil. So we are advancing very quickly in our decarbonization as no other is doing. Brazil is prepared to receive investments, international investments. We already have, are generating more renewable energy than we actually consume and we have huge potential for the northeast of the country to have investments that will allow us to develop green energy, green products that can be exported. We are concluding the regulation of, the, of green hydrogen in Congress, so we will be able through this system to store green energy, and we want to th do that taking into account the need for uh, food security. We are a big producer, this is recognized, but we still depend a lot on fertilizers, especially nitrogen-based fertilizers. So we want to produce green hydrogen, green ammonia, so that we can, ammonium, so that we can ensure Brazil 
is helping in terms of food security, and then we can later also export these products and provide that sustainability to others, so others can benefit from it. President Lula recognizes that this is a huge opportunity. It's He's looking very closely at all these developments. And I go back to quoting Pope Francis, because this energy transition needs to be done in a very just, fair, and balanced way, as well as in an inclusive way, so that our societies can transform. Thank you very much. Minister, I'll go back to talking about G20. The Ministry of Health is also cooperating in that sense. What are some of the ways that you want to discuss health and to bring it to the table when we talk about sustainability and how is the government going to help articulate those discussions? Well, just to mention the environment and health is a relationship we've established since the conference in Stockholm. And Josué do Castro, a Brazilian person, criticized at the time during this conference a development model and an economic model that was just based on immediate cons consumption. This was back in 72. It's a huge reference that we've uh, used, especially when fighting hunger. So this is a reference we have kept with us. It has been with us during ECHO 92. But I think today there is a strong focus on health. Because, as was mentioned by Marina and by Minister Alexandri, the world is currently undergoing the dramatic effects of climate change. It's not about protecting ourselves, about what will come in the future, about potential risks or threats. No, we are suffering these impacts already. So we need to look at the future, of course, but the future starts today. And our actions need to start today as well. In that sense, and because of everything that was said so far, I think Brazil has a major contribution that it can provide. And we're here to bring these forward, but also to hear from others about their experiences. In the case of G20, it's very well in line with what we discussed during COP28. So the first step is reducing inequality, which is an essential aspect throughout the G20 presidency. In all areas, this will be a focus. Inequality in itself has a concept of justice. It's not about talking about poverty or lack of access. When we talk about inequality, it means that we want to organize the world in a different way. So this is a point that's very essential in a country like ours, which is one of the most unequal. The G20 agenda has four pillars. I will mention all of them. The first, well, I don't think it's necessarily in order, but the first is that I want to highlight is climate change and health. This is an essential pillar. We cannot talk about G20 targets for health if we don't relate these to climate change. Second topic or pillar is preparation. How, based on the dramatic experience we've had during the pandemic of COVID-19, how can we rethink the way in which we work, the way in which we organize our health systems? And during this preparation, we also need to focus on the idea of uh, resilient health systems, of surveillance in the case of new pathogens, new diseases, and how society could be prepared. But aside from that, preparation also means having well-integrated health systems that are able to respond, as well as the entire economic and industrial complex of health. And we are proposing a regional alliance looking more specifically at developing countries and the big inequality that lies within these countries, 
regarding their own possibilities of being autonomous in terms of developing solutions in health. So this is what we're proposing. We're proposing this broad alliance during the agenda as well, in our agenda as well. And I today discuss with CD Africa because they have a very similar vision to ours. And finally, the other pillar is equity in health, thinking both access, about access to service and to goods. So everything is well integrated in a sense. And finally, but not less important, digital health. This was one of the major uh, propositions of India. And we brought it back by saying that we believe digital health, which involves integrating data, uh, remote consultation, artificial intelligence, and other important topic, all of this needs to be guided by the principle, once again, of equality. So the four pillars that I mentioned are very well integrated. And the most important aspect in the case of health is to think about the contribution of different areas for the quality of life and health of people on the one hand, but also to have health systems that can be both resilient to be able to face emergencies that could be sanitary emergencies, as is the case of an epidemic, as climate emergencies, as we've seen so many examples of, and as Marina has mentioned very clearly. So we need them to be resilient and sustainable, sustainable in economic, social, and environmental terms. So in sum, this is the proposition that we will take to the G20 presidency that will be up for debate, not a debate that needs to happen between only health players. It needs to be multi-sectorial, multi-player, and involve civil society. And that's the last topic I want to bring. In the case of health, we've had a strong tradition in Brazil based on the creation of our unified health system, SUS, SUS, to have social participation in the process. Thank you. We have some, com some time for final comments. I know, Marina, you have a very intense agenda here. What are your perspectives? How is the financial market responding to Brazil's propositions? And how are negotiations going? I think we're also very, we're always very well uh, received and welcomed at COP27 back in Egypt. Lots of people said they had missed Brazil. And the fact that we are missed because we are a developing country that has possibilities in terms of investments, and we're ready to receive these investments. We're doing our homework to be able to do a series of reforms, such as the tax reform, to help these investments happen, making sure we have fiscal responsibility, but also we're looking at the social commitments that President Lula has made. So we're well welcomed and we also see a lot of interest on behalf of investors, multi multi multilateral investment banks and agencies, and of course philanthropy. I participated in a group of philanthropists that's very relevant that meets every year at the forum. And some of them were stating how much it's been important for them to be able to contribute to Brazil and Brazilian efforts. When we brought the Amazon fund back in 2023, we had 3 billion highs, and now we already have an additional 3 billion highs with a total of 6 billion available. One other topic which we have to look at very carefully is the initiative of the Ministry of F the Economy together with the BNDS and other sectors to a try and establish a climate fund. The climate fund already has 10 billion reais, so $2 billion, with the possibility that the Inter-American Bank might 
provide an additional 2 billion, so a total of 20 billion for sustainable investment. Looking at bioeconomy, for instance, looking at trackability of agricultural products in Brazil, which is very important so we can separate what's well produced from what's produced in bad conditions, and also helping those who are not able to get there yet to improve their production capabilities and conditions. So I think we've been, uh, there's been good reception. Of course, there's a lot of challenges that we have to overcome as well. We are dealing with the climate issues, with the investments that need to be made on our side, but I think we also need to create a market for some of these products, the products from biodiversity, for instance, that have to follow a set of sp specific rules, and also the efforts that President Lula has made regarding renewable energy, Looking at the accumulated experience we have in Brazil, we have decades of technology that we've been producing for ethanol, for example. We have a competitive advantage in terms of the technologies we've developed for that, and we want to explore them more and more so that they can provide even more opportunities for a country to develop. But of course, we look at that in light of the current con uh, current difficulties. We have the presidency of G20. Four developing countries are going to be leading these organizations. And if these countries determine to reduce CO2 emissions, they will make a difference. If they try and fight inequality, they can make a difference. If they set out to ensure that technological advances advances are shared, they can make a difference. So the legacy we have is from going, well, from Indonesia, India, then now it's with Brazil, and then it goes to South Africa. So this of itself is a huge opportunity for developing countries to create more synergy. Because you have the convention on the one hand, what's agreed upon, and then those who are actually going to put it in practice on the field so the transformation actually happens. So my final message is that we have to look at the world. We're looking at our continent. Latin America has about 600 million inhabitants. Lots of resources are available, and this can make a difference if we're able to mobilize all of that in the context of the current crisis. Lula mentioned at the UN that our challenges are climate, fighting inequality, and peace. And when we think about peace, it's peace between men, but also peace with nature, being at peace with nature, because the challenges that we are facing are asking all of us to work very hard in that sense. I'm going to emphasize, by, uh, to conclude by saying that G20 is going to discuss inequality, bioeconomy, how to value and preserve the ecosystemic services, and we have a global initiative to protect tropical forests, thinking both in terms of protection but also sustainable use of forests and their products, looking at traditional communities, which is a huge challenge we have. 80% of forests have been cared for, quote unquote, by traditional peoples. However, they are being, uh, they are facing huge difficulties in many areas, which is why President Lula has started to fight illegal mining, to remove people, to evict these uh, invaders. And so in the case of Brazil, we want to fight inequality with sustainability by strengthening our democracy. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you all for your presence. And I will give you 30 seconds for your final comments. Brazil is a country that is very well placed geopolitically. 
in terms of energy. It is contributing to the protection of the planet. It wants to use G20 as an opportunity to show that this new economy that is uh, an inclusive one can change the planet and to bring what we all pursue, which is social and economic stability. We have this in the Americas. Uh, we have peace amongst the peoples, and we're going to do this with prosperity, with economic uh, development, balancing out income development and sustainability, which are crucial for this synergy of public policy so that we can build the society we want. In the case of health, it is important to remember that actions in this field, and this will also apply to the G20, as we have said here, health has to be seen in a, in a more encompassing political uh, vision in uh, President Lula's <coughs> sorry, administration with peace as a center. So we have to think about environmental justice and to fight inequality. And one of the main inequalities in countries is that of inequality in innovation, science, and technology. So everything that I said in the beginning about the industrial complex and social complex of health leads us into thinking about an alliance of countries that can make us overcome this inequality, which became so evident during the COVID-19 pandemic, when only 1% of countries could start the vaccination and so could more quickly save lives than other countries. And I think that this is a very uh, um, clear evidence of how we can overcome these problems in health and in other areas. Thank you very much. Yeah.